So good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Royal Society of Medicine. It's so nice to have people back in this building for the last 18 months. It's been quiet as mice around here, but now people are coming back again. We're all triple vaccinated and uh, uh, things are looking much better. So I am Roger Kirby. I'm currently the president of the Royal Society of Medicine. And uh, tonight's a very interesting uh, experiment really because it's not only live in this auditorium this very nice uh, lecture theater the nine dangle lecture theater but we're also uh, online and we have an audience of i think nearly 300 people online so hello everybody out there i hope you can see us and hear us i wish you were here but we're so glad that you are joining us so i'm going to read this out because the, leslie has such an amazing cv that i couldn't possibly remember all the details and i think it's really interesting to know a bit about Leslie before she gives her what I'm sure is going to be an absolutely brilliant speech tonight. So Dame Leslie Reagan is a professor and head of Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Imperial College NHS Trust St Mary's Hospital. That's a bit of a mouthful. But she's also deputy head of the Division of Surgery, at Oncology and Reproductive Biology at Imperial College London. Importantly, she was elected president of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2016. She was the second woman and the first in 64 years to hold this position. Wow, that is impressive. In her first presidential address, she discussed the importance of a healthy lifestyle for a safe pregnancy and the risks of obesity. Very good thing to talk about. Leslie graduated from the Royal Free Hospital uh, in 1980 before becoming a registrar in obstetrics at the Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. She was awarded an MD thesis uh, for uh, the Research, Council, Research Council's Embryo and Gamete Research Group before moving to London to be a consultant at St. Mary's Hospital, famous for its rugby team. I don't suppose she played for that. She's now chair and head of the department. This is the next important thing. This is from Wikipedia. You can read it for yourself, but I think it's more fun if I read it for you. In March, 2007, she featured in the BBC's Prof Reagan's Beauty Parlor. I think that actually that is the number one thing. Uh, yeah. She's one of the first women to hold a chair in obstetrics and gynecology in the UK. The first being Margaret Fairley, who was appointed professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the university in Dundee in 1940. So there's a bit of a gap, wasn't there? <laughs> wow. She's also co-director of the UK's Baby Biobank, a pregnancy tissue archive, which aims to underpin future translational research into major complications of pregnancy. She's written several books on pregnancy and miscarriage, including Your Pregnancy Week by Week. And her book, Miscarriage, What Every Woman Needs to Know, was written in 2018. It explores how one in four pregnancies ends in miscarriage. Dame Leslie Reagan was appointed Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2020 in the New Year Honours for services to women's health care. In the same year, she became Chair of Wellbeing of Women. Wow. Leslie, I mean, that's amazing. You're on. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Roger, for your invitation and for your introduction and the warmth of your welcome. Thank you very much indeed. It's lovely to see so many uh, real faces after such an extraordinary couple of years. And thank you to those of you I know and those of you I don't know, but there's a lot of faces I do know. So it's very lovely to hear. Thank you. So, uh, as you know, this is a, a lecture that is hosted by the Royal Society of Medicine and the Linnaean Society. And rightly or wrongly, I decided to talk about the topic of how can we achieve gender equality? And I hope we can move these slides on. Oops, sorry. How can we achieve gender equality, which is Sustainable Development Goal 5 by 2030? Now, I think most of you know that I'm an obstetrician and gynaecologist. And I've spent much of my professional career looking after women. So I think it's quite easy to understand why I might feel passionate about the issue of gender equality. But what I wanted to do tonight was to start by reflecting on how relevant it is, not just to me, but to everybody. 
and to all of us as doctors and healthcare professionals working to care for patients across what I think is many different specialties in this room. So I'd like to talk to you about what we, what we can do about it, the issue of gender equality, and how most importantly, we can all individually take actions to achieve it. 2030 is not very far away. So in my work as an obstetrician and gynecologist, I've had enormously, um, been enormously privileged. I've had the opportunities to travel and work in countries across the globe. And I think the most important thing to start off by saying is that in many of those places, the picture of gender equality and the subsequent healthcare those women need are very, very different from this country. So I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit about those experiences uh, in my talk. But as a clinician, I think it's fair to say I've witnessed many of the barriers that women across the world are facing, and most crucially, how these barriers are not just in accessing good quality health care, but also barriers in accessing social and economic autonomy. So it's a problem that is complex, and it's a problem that spans many, many areas of life. And I'm only going to be able to do justice to the health side of it tonight. There are many, many aspects of gender equality that transverse, traverse into many other disciplines and many other fields. So this is Charles Darwin, who lived from 1809 to uh, 1882. He's a very famous uh, 19th century English naturalist, geologist and biologist. But I think he's probably best known for his contribution to the science of evolution. You'll see here three of his most, most well-known tomes, The Origin of Species, The Voyage of the Beagle, um, and The Descent of Man. The Origin of Species was published in 1859, and this was his hypothesis on the natural selection and the basis of human evolution. And then in 1871, he laid the foundation for all modern work on the mechanisms of sex selection in his book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. Now, this Darwin lecture, as I said, is jointly hosted by the Linnaean Society and the Royal Society of Medicine. And I'd like to pay tribute to my 12 predecessors who've given this lecture. And I think you'll agree with me that they share a recognizable evolutionary tray. <laughs> now, I'm going to start by introducing you to the UN Sustainable Goals, the Development Goals. They span the 15 year period from the 1st of January, 2016 to the 31st of December, 2030. So we've only got eight and a bit years to go. And they are, as it says here, a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. But specifically, they are designed to end poverty, to protect the planet and ensure prosperity for all. And of course, the SDGs are following on from the Millennium Development Goals, of which there were only eight. And two of the 17 SDGs explicitly recognize the importance of girls and women and their health and achieving gender equality to achieve the overall ambitious aim of the SDGs. So it's SDG three, which is the green one in the middle at the top, good health and well-being, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. And that includes a specific uh, commitment to reduce global maternal mortality, and also to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive healthcare services. And SDG 5, which is what I'm going to focus on primarily this evening, which is achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. And again, it underlines the importance of sexual and reproductive health, but it also makes a commitment to eliminating all forms of violence against women and girls in the public and the private sphere, including trafficking, sexual and other types of exploitation, and eliminating all harmful practices such as child, early and forced marriage and female genital mutilation. But unlike its predecessor, MDG5 and MDG3, the goals are going to call on governments across the world to achieve rather than just promote gender equality and the empowerment of all girls. And of course, as you'll see on the right-hand side, it's the map, my, my I tribute to my daughter, Claire, for, for constructing it for me. Um, none of them are standalone. All of these goals are intertwined. Every one of them leads to the other and then on to the next. So why sustainable? Why are we calling them sustainable development goals? Well, sustainability means longevity. What we've got to do is try to ensure that we've got long-term strategies, which are going to be crucially necessary for all our futures. 
and intersect through all segments of our societies and lives. Now, the Cambridge Dictionary offers us two definitions of sustainability, which I've shared with you here. The quality of being able to continue over a period of time, and also the quality of causing little or no damage to the environment, and therefore being able to continue for a long time. But sustainability is longevity, and that's what these SDGs are about. All the roads lead back to gender equality. So we as physicians here can create enormous change, not just in SDG 5, but for all the other SDGs, because this really is pivotal to achieving them. And on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see some of the areas where we really do have to step up uh, and make, take more action. Promoting women's equal participation in decision making is absolutely crucial. Only a quarter of parliaments have ministers or have, have members of parliaments, 25% um, of them. Uh, in local government, in managerial positions, less than 30%. We know that uh, there will be 10 million girls who are at risk of child marriage. Um, and in addition to the 100 million who are going to be uh, projected to become child brides before the pandemic. So an enormous problems. And then the issues of violence against women, which I'm not going to be able to pay justice to this evening, really is a shocking problem. It's a problem that intersects every part of society. There is no global distribution that's different. It goes through all socioeconomic bands. But one in three women has been subjected to physical and or sexual violence at least once in their lifetime, starting from the age of 15 onwards. So it's a massive, massive problem. And of course, added to which we've lived over the last 18 months or so with the COVID pandemic, which is adding to the burden of unpaid domestic and care work and really squeezing many women out of the workforce. And that of all, of course, we have to add on to the fact that women were already known to spend about two and a half times as many hours as men on unpaid domestic um, home and care work. So I also found myself asking, uh, well, I asked myself rather when I was preparing this, was what Mr. Darwin would have thought about my talk tonight, gender equality. His views were based on the hypothesis for sex selection, which was 150 years ago. So we must accept the fact that he was a man of his time. And his time was one in which women's horizons were very, very limited. But his writings and his personal life were obviously much more complex than they might first appear. So on the one hand, he wrote in The Descent of Man, which I told you was published in 19, 1871, and I quote, the chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than can women, whether requiring deep thought, reason or imagination, or merely the use of senses and hands. I don't know what he'd have made of this lecture. On the other hand, his daughter Henrietta, and he had 10 children, and he married Emma Wedgwood, his cousin, who was a millionaireess, the Wedgwood family, had 10 children, but Henrietta played a really crucial role in editing The Descent of Man. And there is a fascinating project um, that has been conducted by a group of um, academics at Cambridge University about Darwin's correspondence with more than 150 women, which demonstrates very, very clearly how he really did an enormous amount during his life to help advance women in their careers, not just in science, but also in education, and to my surprise, in the women's suffrage movement. So he was a complex man. And just like gender equality is a complex problem. And I suppose if it wasn't complex and multifaceted, the problem would have been sorted a long time ago and there wouldn't be any need for me to give this talk. Now, women hold up half the sky is a Chinese proverb, which inspired the best-selling book by the New York Times columnist, Nick Kristoff and his wife, Cheryl Wudun, who published their book, Half the Sky, I think in 2011, and they won the Pulitzer Prize for it. What I think was very interesting about this book and very moving, and I thank Jenny, my other twin, for giving me a copy of this book uh, back in 2011, was that the two of them recount stories from around the world of their travels and of the extraordinary women and girls that they've met, flagging up the girls and women and their courage and determination to succeed and to thrive despite the extraordinary barriers and obstacles put in their way. But the conclusion of their book which I'm trying to paraphrase here in this slide, is that they feel 
that historians look back at each century that we pass through as having an overriding challenge to deal with and hopefully to overcome. And Nick Christoph and Cheryl Wudan suggested that historians look back on the 19th century and believe that it was the abolition of slavery, which was the main predicament that had to be resolved. The 20th century, tackling racial discrimination and totalitarianism. And they firmly believe that historians will look back in the 22nd century at our century, the 21st, and ask the question, were we able to achieve gender equality? And it's important gender equality because it's the keystone for change. And as, our, as the late Kofi Annan, when he was UN Secretary General, famously quoted, study after study has taught, it, taught us that there is no tool more effective for global development than the empowerment of women. Now I'd like to move on more specifically to health and disadvantage and determinants in equality. And this, these quotes are come from Michael Marmot, who is another one of my heroes, who I think many of you will know, the Marmot Review, published in 2010, entitled Fair Society, Healthy Lives. But I think it was important that he pointed something out, or rather, I had to come to terms with the fact that my generation of doctors had really been trained to work in a disease intervention service. Much of the time, we focused on diagnosing a problem when they occur, and then trying to fix them. The fact of life, of course, is that healthcare services contribute only a third of improvements to life expectancy, but it's changing lifestyles and removing health inequalities, something the health service doesn't provide, which contribute the remaining two thirds. And it's a fact of life that our NHS spends about 120 billion on treating disease and about 15 to 20 billion on prevention. So there's something quite wrong with the books here and the way we're approaching this. But of course, to an obstetrician and gynaecologist, the most exciting thing about Michael Marmot's summary in 2010 was the fact that he pointed out and emphasized repeatedly that the life course approach is absolutely essential if you want to really improve health and life expectancy. And the life course approach is important and that the disadvantage starts before birth and it accumulates through life. So an obstetrician and gynaecologist finds that very enticing. And I think it's really important to emphasize that women's health needs are entirely predictable. And the vast majority of occasions when women go to health services, they are not ill. They're actually seeking help to manage day-to-day -day life issues. So if you look at this graph, it's a graph from naught to 60 plus years along the bottom. And you'll see at the far side, what's really important to girls is that they get, and boys for that matter, is that they get good sex and relationship education at school and that they get their HPV vaccine at the age of 12 to protect them from cervical cancer. And somewhere sometime around that time, they'll start having menstrual periods. And they're gonna have about 12 of these a year for 40 years of their life. So this is something that happens to them very regularly. And they need contraception because I think they need to decide when and with whom and how many times they want to become pregnant. And you'll see from this graph that in fact, pregnancy care uh, is only now relevant to 80% of the population. One in five women are going to choose or are not able to have children. And I often reflect on the fact that there's this little bit down here called assisted conception, which I spent mm, 25 years researching both in, in clinical and academic terms uh, on the causes of the current miscarriage. And I look at this graph of women's predictable health needs and I realize how inconsequential all of that was. And then of course, there's an inevitability that women of my generation are going to become menopausal because we all live so long. So sometime between the age of 45 and 55, every woman's going to become menopausal. And of course, until very recently, we did nothing about these women. They, they hit the menopause. If they were lucky, they got a bit of help with a bit of HRT or a few antidepressants sometimes, and then we waited for them to fall over at a later stage in their life. And yet we know there's so much that we can do around the fifth and sixth decade to prevent problems later in life if we don't just wait for them to happen and we actually uh, predict what they're going to need and put, um, put, put measures in place to do so. So coming back to Marmot, I think the other thing he really helped, was helpful in, in emphasizing for us is that how health inequalities stem from social inequalities. 
And he talks, as you know, about the causes of health inequalities and then the causes of the causes, which are the circumstances in which we are born and grow and live and work and age. And of course, he tells us at great length that the poor tend to be unhealthy, but the key message I think from his report is that the best health and life expectancy doesn't follow wealth, it follows achieving secondary education. So you can buy yourself good health only up to a point, but if you haven't completed your secondary education, you're never going to be as healthy and have a long, as long life expectancy as your next door neighbor who did. And of course, the other thing he points out is that medicine is all failed prevention. And he constantly asks the question, why are we treating people and then sending them back to the conditions that make them sick? And this is his subsequent book published in September 2015 called The Health Gap, which I'm sure many of you've read. But importantly, and going back to my global remit here, he goes on to say, if I had to choose a single recommendation to improve health, it would be education. And in a global context, the education of women, because education is central to women's empowerment. And that brings me back to those sustainable development goals, because education is the common thread, the common thread that links all of them in that map on the right side. Now, if I may, I'm going to turn to maternal mortality and talk to you a little bit about how we can look at this as a metric of gender equality. Because maternal mortality, which we measure in the numbers of women dying per 100,000 births or 100,000 deliveries, is an indicator of the extent to which that society values the woman and prioritizes her reproductive health. And it's also a measure of the inequities that intersect across gender and ethnicity, race, a socioeconomic background, and where she lives. And the real social determinants of maternal mortality the status of girls in that society in which she lives, the level to which they've been empowered, usually whether they're literate or not, and therefore their ability to make healthy choices for themselves. So let's look at the numbers. So there are, well, this year there will be another 230 million pregnancies in our, in our world. Um, 85 million will be unplanned, that's about a third of them. 56 million of them will be induced abortions, about half of them will be unsafe, and overall, another 303,000 women are going to die because they became pregnant. And of those 300,000, one in four, 25%, will be adolescent girls, young girls. And of course, deaths are something that we can count, although I suspect that the numbers that we get from the WHO and the UN are an underestimate. In addition to every death, there are another 30 life-changing morbidities for girls and women across the globe. And if we look at this map of maternal mortality and the ratio dating back to 27 from the World Bank, red is the highest maternal, maternal mortality, orange slightly less, and you will see how the burden of maternal mortality is really held in the global south predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa and particularly Central Africa and some areas of Southeast Asia. And that red blob, of course, over there is Afghanistan, which is programmed to get much, much worse in this next couple of years. So if we look now at the lifetime risk of a death due to pregnancy, on the right-hand side, we see that Sweden is the best place in the world to be pregnant. So your lifetime risk of dying because you became pregnant is about 1 in 17,400 in Sweden. And if you take the average for developed countries, it's about 1 in 7,000. Move to the left-hand side of the slide, and you'll see why in some countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they have farewell parties at 36 weeks instead of having a baby shower. In North Africa, the risk of dying is 1 in 210. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, 20, 1 in 22. And the figure drops to one in eight in Chad, or perhaps I should say it rises to one in eight in Chad, which means that if you're a girl in Chad, you've got more chance of dying because you became pregnant and you've got no control over whether you did become pregnant because you've got no access to family planning, more chance of dying than you have of finishing secondary school, which I think is a really chilling statistic for 2021. And of course, those of you who've been interested in global health will know that for years and years and years, we've been taught that these are the main reasons why women die in childbirth in the 21st century. The clinical reasons, the three delays theory, there are cultural reasons, there are economic reasons. There's access to healthcare and their quality of healthcare. And I'm sure they all do play a part, 
But as you'll see from my cartoon, I think they're a little bit of a red herring. And what I'd like to propose to you is that actually the real problem and the real reason why these women are still dying in the 21st century is because they haven't got gender equality. And what we need to provide them with is female literacy and political will to rate those women in those societies and ensure that they don't die in the future. And that's because I think we still classify maternal mortality, roughly speaking, as events that happen in the birthing unit or the delivery unit or the field. And I think that's a little, little bit uh, too little too late. So here you'll see are the top five global causes of maternal mortality, and they are hemorrhage, sepsis, unsafe abortion, preeclampsia, and obstructed labour. Interesting, obstructed labour is only 9%, one in 10. You need lots of facilities to manage someone in obstructed labour, but the other four are potentially preventable with cheap and heat-stable treatments if you've got the wherewithal and the networks to try and ensure that their women are looked after early. So I would say that we have, what we've got to do if we really want to change maternal mortality in a sustainable way is to stop firefighting in the delivery unit in the birthing hut. And we've got to move back upstream to avoid the unplanned pregnancies. And I'm reminded at this moment of one of my heroes as well, Mahmoud Fatala, who's a past president of FIGO and the father of the safe motherhood movement that he founded in 1998, nearly 25 years ago now, it's sad that the he said then is still pertinent today, that women are not dying of diseases we cannot treat. They're dying because the societies they live in have yet to decide that their lives are worth saving. So let's welcome my first elephant in the room, and that's unplanned pregnancy. And now I think what we need to do is to focus back upstream. And I would suggest to you that family planning is the cornerstone to gender equality. And family planning encompasses both contraception and safe abortion. Whatever your views are about it, if you don't have safe abortion, girls and women die. So welcome to the next elephant in the herd, contraception. So let's talk a little bit about family planning. Well, we know this enables women to plan for the future, complete their education, find employment. Women who've got access to family planning usually restrict the number of children in their family. There are 214 million women in our world and girls with no access to any form of family planning whatsoever. And that really is a tragedy because we know that if we can birth space by 18 to 24 months, we can prevent not only maternal deaths from all the reasons that I spoke about earlier and for chronic anemia and illness and infection, but it also dramatically improves the infant survival, not just the baby that was in utero and is born, but also the existing children. If your mother dies delivering your baby brother or sister, there's no one to get you vaccinated, there's no one to get you to school, there's no one to get clean water. And this is the unmet need for contraception put again on that map with the same colour coding of red. And you'll see that it follows almost identically the maternal mortality map that I showed you earlier. And it seems rather extraordinary because it is unequivocal that contraception is the single most cost-effective intervention in healthcare. Uh, no one will argue with that, it just simply is. It is incredibly, incredibly effective and really, really important um, that women are able to access it. So let's look here at the potential impact of what happens happening in COVID-19 on women's sexual and reproductive health services in 132 low and middle income countries. And this was an estimate put forward by the Guttmacher Institute in April 2020 as a guesstimate, or a best guess, for what might happen uh, with the COVID lockdown. And they estimated, and they've certainly been proven right and possibly to have underestimated it, that a disruption in the central SRH care, uh, i.e. a 10% decline in the use of short and long acting reversible contraceptives would lead to another 50 million additional women with unmet need and another 15 and a half million more unintended pregnancies. Going back to the family planning, and now we're going to talk a bit about abortion and this may upset some people. There are 213 million pregnancies per year, as I told you before, 56 million induced abortions and 25 million, about half of them unsafe. So that means that one in seven maternal deaths are due to unsafe abortion. So welcome to the herd, unsafe abortion. 
And I think it's really important that although it's a polarizing topic, whatever your views are about it, as I was saying earlier, if you live in a society where you don't provide the choice for safe abortion, then it is inevitable that girls and women will die because the problem doesn't go away. It just goes underground and becomes unsafe. So outlawing it makes it worse. It doesn't stop it, it makes it worse. One in four pregnancies ends in abortion. That's 150,000 cases a day. 50% of those induced ones are unsafe. And 97% of all the unsafe abortions are occurring in those developing countries in the global south. So restrictive abortion laws lead to unsafe abortion and maternal deaths. So the legal, legal restrictions have very little effect on the request, but a very large effect on the outcome. And I want to remind you again that one in four of the unsafe abortions are sought by young girls, our children, or perhaps I should say our grandchildren now. So I think that we have to make an argument for abortion being essential in healthcare for women, whatever our personal views are about it, recognizing that outlawing it makes it worse. Here's a map now, again, color coded in the same way, uh, about the legal state of abortion. I hope one or two of you will question that big swathe of green on the left-hand side because the US seems to be going backwards and very soon that's going to become red. But I'd like you to focus on, if you can just see it, perhaps I can point it out here, um, on the UK and Ireland. Ireland is now green, paradoxically, with the events over the last couple of years, both the Republic and the Northern Ireland have more liberal laws than England and Scotland, which I think is um, something to comment on. And I've already made a comment about the US and I won't waste more time on that, but I just wanted to remind you that just across the border from the US in Canada, Canada decriminalized abortion in 1998. It didn't mean it deregulated it, it's, it's very carefully regulated, but it's not in criminal law. It doesn't have conditions that specify on what circumstances an abortion is legal. They have, as a result, an abortion rate which is lower than the UK, uh, and it enjoys one of the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world. And here on this graph, you see what happens to the induced abortion rate in sub-Saharan African countries that are um, dependent on US aid. And when the global gag rule or the Mexico City policy, which each Republican presidency invokes as soon as they come into office to restrict any US aid being spent on any form of abortion care or contraception, you'll see what happens. So the blue arrow in the middle there is the point at which in 2001, George W. Bush reinstated the global gag rule and look what happens to abortions. They shoot up because of course, contraception services and all forms of SRH services uh, are restricted too. So it doesn't solve the problem, it makes it worse. And then here is another estimate from the Guttmacher Institute dating back to April 2020 about how the disruption in essential SRH care is going to mean um, a shift in abortions from safe to unsafe of another 10%. So in addition to those additional women with unmet need and the more unintended pregnancies, it's predicted that there's going to be another 3 million more unsafe abortions and another 10,000 additional maternal deaths as a result of it. And the problems are not just there in sub-Saharan Africa. In, during the COVID, elective abortions were banned in six European countries and suspended in one. And in the USA, as I've already mentioned, numerous states have used COVID as an excuse to ban all forms of abortion by classifying it as non-essential health care. I hope I've made the point that there's nothing could be more essential in women's health care. So, the next elephant I'm going to welcome to the room or welcome to the herd is violence and abuse. And difficult as a topic as it is, I think we do have to acknowledge that the, during the shadow pandemic, or rather we have now, we refer to a shadow pandemic because violence has escalated uh, amongst women uh, in almost all societies during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. It's a very difficult topic. It's a difficult topic for people to discuss. It's a difficult topic, I think, for people to really comprehend the enormity of the problem and how common it is and how it transects every part of our society. Well-educated women, wealthy women, women living in good socioeconomic circumstances, they're all affected. And I think one of the things that we will have to think about very carefully is that we've got to change the language of how we talk about this problem. Um, I was very impressed by a man called Dr. Jackson Katz, who did a very interesting TED talk 
and very interesting um, podcast talking about how we need to turn it more proactively into not talking about violence against women, but talking about men who are violent to women or men who rape women. But the statistics are there on the slide. One in three women face this problem in their lifetimes. That means that 15 to 34 year old women and girls are more likely to be disabled or die from domestic violence and abuse than from cancer, malaria, road traffic accidents and war combined. And 30 to 60 percent of women experience some form of physical or sexual violence from a husband or a boyfriend, i.e. an intimate partner. So although women account for a much smaller share of the total homicides in this country and any other country, about 20 percent, and men 80 percent, but they bear the brunt, women bear the brunt of intimate partner, family homicide, 64 percent, and when according to intimate partner homicidal deaths, 82 percent. And of course, as obstetricians and gynecologists, we see an enormous amount uh, of the survivors. They're not victims, of course, we should shouldn't say we're victims, we're survivors, um, because we know that 35% of all domestic violence and abuse starts or escalates in pregnancy. So after road traffic accidents, it's the most common trauma that women experience during pregnancy. Often there are multiple sites of injury for all sorts of complex reasons, and teenagers are at greatest risk. I could obviously talk to you a great deal about it. I mean, it's an incredibly difficult problem. Um, and as you know, survivors rarely um, present until they've suffered multiple assaults. And we know as well, it's got a vast economic cost to our society. Uh, it's been estimated in the UK at least five years ago that this complex public health need probably swallows about 23 billion of health and social care costs. So it is a real, real problem. And then in 2019, uh, Cressida Dick, who was leading the, or still is leading the London uh, Met Metropolitan Police Force, uh, talked about the fact that the Met receives, remember this is just Greater London, so a population of what, 8 million, a uh, call about domestic violence every 30 seconds. That totals a million calls a year. That's a lot of telephone calls when you think that the, the person telephoning to report the problem has probably been assaulted on at least four occasions before finding the courage to report it. And we know that during the COVID-19 lockdown, that the number of calls has been doubled. It really is a pandemic. And because today is the 17th of November, 2021, and it is the first year anniversary of the WHO Cervical Cancer Elimination Program, I thought I should just mention something about cervical cancer because it's the fourth most common cancer in women. There are another 500,000 new cases every year. There are more than 300,000 deaths globally from a disease which is entirely preventable with a cheap vaccine. So the deaths from cervical cancer this year for the first time are going to exceed maternal mortality. And you can read on the slide. It's been predicted that if we don't do something about vaccination and early screening and early treatment, and we don't scale up our efforts across the, across the globe, we're going to be faced with 450,000 entirely preventable deaths annually in the not too distant future. The WHO programme has got these three pillars of um, vaccination for young people, uh, screening um, and, and then um, early surgery. Remembering, well, of course, that if you live in the global south, the chance of you being able to access a radiotherapy machine are negligible. And major surgery or complex pelvic surgery and radiotherapy are the cornerstones of invasive cervical cancer. I think the other thing I should just mention before I move on as I said, HPV vaccine is cheap and it's very cost effective. So we really do need to encourage governments to follow what we've done and to spend them. It's been calculated that for 4 billion US dollars, you can either vaccinate a cohort of 58 million 12 year old girls to prevent 700,000 cases of cervical cancer and 420,000 deaths during their lifetime, or you can buy 12 fighter jets. So back to my theme, women hold up half the sky and how are we going to do it? And I remember some time ago when I was talking about this, Herb, Bert Peterson, a great friend of mine, had done an enormous amount of work at the WHO in promoting women's health and gender equality, said it's very, very simple, Leslie. All you have to do is the four E's. You've got to end discrimination. You've got to eliminate gender-based violence. You've got to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health care. And you've got to eradicate child early and forced marriage. It's the four E's. And I use this slide 
And then at the end of my talk, a lovely young woman came up to me and she said, you know, Professor Regan, I really enjoyed your talk. I'm so interested and I'd like to talk to you more about it. But the problem is you haven't told me what you want me to do. And it really made me think. So I'm now going to spend a few moments talking about some of the things that you can do and that we have got right, because everything's been a bit gloomy so far, but there are some really very positive things on the horizon. So I'm going to, I call them the case studies, I'm going to talk about firstly about the Leading Safe Choices programme, which I think was probably the most useful thing that I've done during my career, which was to get this money from the Buffett Foundation for a four-year programme to run family planning, both safe abortion care and postpartum coil insertion um, in South Africa and Tanzania. It was a four-year programme uh, between 20, uh, 15, uh, 2014, in fact, and 2018. And it was an attempt to try and skill up the local healthcare professionals, some of whom had very, very lowly qualifications, to do something about preventing the 22 million unsafe abortions and the two and prevent and rather reduce the number of 225 million who've got no access to family planning. So this is a, a slide that we used at the starting of the program when we chose our, 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 our title of leading safe choices. Um, and you'll see that it was 225 million at that time that didn't have access. So we got somewhere because it's down to 214, but there's still a long way to go. So what the program was about was about training these the, training other healthcare professionals um, in country to undertake uh, postpartum coil insertion, because remember, in many, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the only time a woman or the first time a woman ever meets a healthcare professional is when she delivers her baby. So we suddenly we used to play around with the idea, yes, we had we deliver the baby, placenta out and then the coil in. Um, but I'm trying to be, I'm being flippant there. But postpartum family planning was a major plank of this. And then in South Africa, which has got very liberal abortion law, comprehensive abortion care, it's got very liberal laws, but very, very small capacity and enormous pushback, both from both government uh, and from societal causes to, to um, making it a shameful practice. And then, of course, in Tanzania, which has got some of the most restrictive abortion laws in the world, we had to provide training in post-abortion care to manage hemorrhage and sepsis when women came in, having visited um, backstreet abortionists. That's how we started off the program. Uh, we started it off producing best practice papers, which we developed and we disseminated, uh, showing the healthcare professionals what they needed to do, what they needed to know about. And then we organized training, and all sorts of uh, on, hands on training. But the most important thing I think that we did was then to add two bits, and I'm going to go back to my previous slide, to actually, we added the family planning counselling and the values clarification workshops. And we found that that really then did help enormously. And the third part of the programme, which was really, really crucial and which we hadn't really envisaged at right at the beginning, but then we majored on, was the supervision and mentoring. So if you've, if you've been trained to do one task, you probably need someone to come along on a monthly basis and tell you you're doing a good job. And you need to be reminded about what you need to do. And it was really, really important. So ongoing supportive supervision and on the job mentorship was a real, was a really important thing. And it really was a changing hearts and minds um, program. And in this graph, you will see that the orange lines go up with a, with, with a postpartum uh, coil insertion in, in all the South African pilot sites. And it went up corresponding to the green stars against along the bottom, which is when the mentors got in. Now the mentors actually were the cheapest part of the whole program, but they were the thing that actually made it change and really made it work. And we spent a lot of time analysing <clears throat> what the barriers had been, because, of course, we had to cope with uh, conscientious objection and personal values, both for contraception and abortion care at provider level. And at health system level, there was all sorts of problems with priority setting and funding and supporting providers. But I think the biggest issue that, or the biggest barrier we had to overcome uh, was the government level and the political will, uh, which was crucial, absolutely crucial to succeed. And then you'll see me on the right hand side with one of the most uh, wonderful women, Judy Atranapay, when I'm leave, uh, handing back the programme to the Western Cape government, because they actually did really truly embed it in their, in their programme. And the other thing I wanted to tell you briefly about was the Better for Women report, which was published by the uh, RCOG at the end of my presidency in 2019, which was really a women's health strategy to try to achieve gender equality. And I can't go into great detail about it, but I think it's important to re re remind you that one of, the re one, of the, one of the things that this report highlighted was that women are 51% of the population, 47% of the workforce, they carry out the vast majority of unpaid care and work, 
but their health really hasn't received the attention it deserves. And there are enormous variations in access and quality of service. There's a real postcode lottery in the UK. And that they're experiencing health inequalities and outcomes that could so easily be avoided and prevented and would therefore be so much cheaper to provide if we did it sensibly. We based it on a life course approach and we focused on access to accurate education and information, making sure that women became part of the solution, prevention and empowerment, and we flagged up the fragmentation and access to services, which really had to change. But the primary aim, and there were 23 recommendations, the primary aim was the creation of an NHS-led women's health strategy. And then, of course, COVID hit. But I think it's important to remember what Winston Churchill used to say, never waste a crisis, because we've had some unexpected wins for gender equality uh, with COVID. The first being the introduction of telemedicine for early medical abortion recommended for years by the WHO and NICE and RCOG, but it took a global pandemic to get it kick-started in the UK, and it was very successfully and swiftly implemented. We must ensure that it continues after COVID is over, because it definitely has improved and reduced the complication rate and the gestational age of these pregnancy um, um, terminations. It really is a, a real boon. And then the other thing that I think it's important about is how post-delivery contraception is now accepted as being much more important. I spent 30 years at Imperial trying to persuade our maternity units to provide every woman who delivers a baby with a year's worth of contraception before they go home. And I kept arguing it would be very much cheaper, it'd be very much better. But it took the pandemic and recognising that no one could get to a GP. There are no more family planning clinics. They were all axed by Public Health England. Um, so they would have to do something. And so in the northwest London region now, which, which there are about 30,000 births per year, most women are offered post-delivery contraception. It's very, very simple. And in the small writing on the bottom left, you can see the business case, which the commissioners have now swept up because it's going to save them an awful lot of money because we're going to reduce many unplanned pregnancies. And I just wanted to pay tribute to the three people on the right of the slide who campaigned for such a long time with me to get this over the line. Um, and also to ensure that progesterone only pills are now available over the counter. You don't have to go to a doctor and get them prescribed. You can actually get them over the counter. Not rocket science. It should have happened 30 years ago. And then just last night, I went to a reception for the Gender Equality Advisory Council who've just published their report, which they've entitled Building Back Better for Women and Girls. It was also to honour Dennis McQuigway, who you remember was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2018 for his fantastic contributions in the Pansy Hospital in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, for putting back together the, uh, the women with most appalling atrocities um, and injuries where rape is used as a weapon of war. Sadly, he wasn't able to come to the reception last night because he, he himself had to have some emergency surgery, but his visit was going to coincide with the launch of his book, The Power of Women, which is a really compelling read. And I was very interested to see that the, um, the, the publication that they circulated last night and the speeches were all referring to the UN women's mantra, well, you can't win uh, for gender equality with only half the team. So um, what can we do? And how can we go about achieving gender equality and SDG 5 by 2030? So um, I've tried to tell you a little bit about women's, as globally as it is, women who are overwhelmingly negatively affected by gender equality. I've only really talked about women. I think there are a lot of men that would benefit from gender equality as well. But I'm struck as I look around the room tonight of how every person in this room, a woman has had quite a profound impact on their lives. And for those same people in the room, a man's had a profound um, impact on their life too. So and that's why the gender equality issue is so very, very important, because it affects us all. And we're all needing to be part of that change. So we really do need to strive to get all of those recommendations from the Better for Women report across the line, because a women's health strategy really will achieve gender equality. And if we can move into prevention rather than treating diseases, things will be a lot cheaper too. I remind you of that proverb, women hold up half the sky, do get that book, Half the Sky, and think about how you can contribute to those historians looking back and saying, yes, they did manage to achieve gender equality in the 21st century. And then, as Ban Ki-moon has said, achieving gender equality requires the engagement of women and men and girls and boys because it's everyone's responsibility. So equality for women is progress for all. 
And I reflect on my own life just briefly that it was my father who really passionately believed and advocated for my education, not my mother. And he adamantly refused to let me believe even for a moment that there wasn't something I could do, or I'd rather was not anything I could not do if I worked hard enough. And I think his attitude has been similar to that of many mentors that I've really been very lucky enough to have across my career. And they've been both male and female, but they've all embodied, I think, in their ways, their ways of thinking, their actions, the core of what this whole issue is about. And that is that gender equality needs to be that people, everybody should have equal access to and be able to get on with what they want to do, regardless of their biological sex. So that, I'm going to finish here. Women hold up half the sky. How can we achieve gender equality SDG 5 by 2030 was my question. I hope that you think that I've come some way to answering it. And I just want to remind you that everyone does have a role to play. And we could ask many people what they think advocacy means. I think it means that the purpose of advocacy rather is to change hearts and minds and persuade people to act differently. And I'm going to leave you this lovely image which I think you'll agree is an equation for our future. And I think as clinicians and physicians, rather, we're quite uniquely placed to ensure we do achieve gender equality. And you see what you do if you get gender equality for men and women, you reach infinity. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. I mean, I think um, I'm sure everybody will agree that was uh, inspiring and uh, clarion message that uh, we all need to change the ways that we work. Uh, I also love the slides because I know that um, we have a majority of people watching this online. And usually when people give hybrid lectures, the slides are far too small for them to read on the often quite small screens that they're looking. So congratulations. I think maybe one of those daughters of yours might have been helpful in that respect. I'm not quite sure which one. So let's see if we can um, get a few questions for Leslie. Anybody in the audience? Because we're, we're online, and I'm not going to pass around the, the microphone because of COVID and viruses and all that jazz. So um, anybody would like to ask Leslie a question? Parveen, let's start with Dame, and one Dame would like to talk to another Dame, I'm sure. So let's just repeat that question So for the people online. So what are you going to do about climate change, which I haven't been able to talk about, and you understand why Parveen It's an enormous topic. And also, I think, with my colleague here from Lillian Mayer's society, he's just come back from COP26, um, and he's going to actually say a few words about climate change. It is enormous, the problem. And as you recognise, and you pointed out, Parveen, women and girls are disproportionately and adversely affected by climate change. It's always them that carry the brunt of it. And also in disaster zones, war zones and refugee camps, it's the women and the children who have the worst um, outcomes because they're always the ones left behind. You know, through, throughout, throughout all, 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 all disasters like that, it's always women and children. I mean, if you talk to David Knott, when he works in, in Syria and in Jordan, he'll tell you that 65% of the emergencies that he's going out there to operate on with his team are women. They're either obstetric or gynecological problems. <coughs> but I can't promise, I can't, I can't answer about the climate change, but I think my colleague will answer something. Two be able questions to then. Should we take the, the, uh, the one on the second row down? Yes, yeah, yeah, you're waving your hand. Just tell us who you are and keep it nice and short because remember they can't hear online. My name is Catherine. I'm active community foundation for the Institute. My father works at the Institute. And I'm an Archive Institute as well. My first group in politics and economics. And you mentioned something really important there, which is political will. And I have to say, bit of my heart sinks a bit because I see there's always arguments about other things taking priority, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's the autumn budget, whether it's um, climate change, and what are your thoughts on really creating and pushing forward the political will? But I completely agree with you, I think that's the crux of it, but how can we push that forward? Just for so repeat, the question, repeat, repeat the question is, so how can you ensure 
that you garner or you harness political will. Well, I think you have to come up with good stories and you have to keep telling the stories and you have to keep relating to this could be your daughter, this could be your wife, this could be your sister, this could be your granddaughter. And I know certainly during my time as vice president and president of the RCAG, talking to two successive health secretaries, it was always about, do you realize that your wife has to go to four different places to get all these things done when she should be able to walk in and get her smear and her contraception or her HRT and her mammogram and all done all together. And they did eventually listen because that women's health strategic group that we took off and now the current secretary of state and the new uh, women, women's ministers are, are collecting all the evidence. In fact, the reason it's taken so long to get that women's health strategy and the call for contributions from the public into print is because they were deluged with, with comments and things, but at least they're doing something about it. Personally, I don't believe it'll be much different from the Better for Women report, which was pretty succinct and it had 23 recommendations. And we do have to grasp every time there is a chink in the armour or a possibility and think imaginatively about how to get things sorted out, like telemedicine abortion. They didn't go, didn't go over the line in March 2020 because the government thought it was better for women. It got there because we said, look, if you don't do this, you're going to actually go against what the prime minister's told us to do, stay at home and protect the NHS. We said three and a half thousand girls and women every week are going to go to facilities, infect the NHS and expose themselves and their families. And that's why it went over the line. And the progestogen only pill, it should have gone over the line or onto the, over the counter 30 years ago. It's one of the safest pharmaceuticals in history. Um, and it took so many years, and years, but it got over the line again because of what's happened with COVID and with lockdown. Interesting that Viagra went over the counter within a year of it being um, produced. A uh, little blue pill, I remember that very well. Um, we had a question <laughs> there, a minutes. question from that side of the audience. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At the bottom. <laughs> no, I mean, I do. I absolutely agree with you. Um, and if I'd spent, if I'd had a lot longer to talk about it, I would have come up with a lot more things that I think we should be doing. And I think sex and relationship education at schools is absolutely critical. And you must be well aware of the, the fight that we've had to get anything half sensible over the line, you know, going to the Department of Education. It's been a real challenge. And I think you would agree, everyone who's interested in this field would agree what's being produced now or promoted now in schools is not perfect, but it's better than what it was. But talking about respectful relationships and no means no um, is really, really important for young people and particularly, as you say, young boys. And as I say, Jackson Katz in his podcast and his uh, TED talk talks very persuasively about ways in which we should change the language and really talk about, you know, it's, you know, how many boys in your school are harassing girls, um, sexually harassing women? How many men are wit raping women, not the other way around? So making them very much part of the solution. And I think it's also very important to think about the um, upset after Sarah Everard and the, uh, many other women who've been murdered since Sarah Everard in March. And the it's not all men movement or hashtag that came about. And I think, again, my tribute to Jackson Katz is that when he was talking about it recently, he said, but of course it's not all men going around abusing women. But it's, if, if I was to say, if Leslie was to say, um, because I don't think I uh, exhibit racial prejudices, that racial discrimination doesn't exist, it's stupid, isn't it? We know it does. So men have got to be part of the solution and all men have got to be part of the solution. That doesn't answer your question. But, um, <laughs> well, I, in, a, in a way, it does. Uh, question there? Uh, I'm uh, Marcel Aventura, and I was uh, running the blood service, and I've done quite a bit in Africa as well and in Asia to develop blood services because that's one of the major causes uh, of women's uh, deaths. But my question is uh, I'm surprised. I'm not surprised today to see that there are so many women here in the audience, and I hope that the, the men are listening at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, uh, it's, uh, and, uh, the education is not only sexual education. That's what I was going uh, to ask you. It's 
the attitude of men towards women mm -hmm. that has to change. It's not only the sexual aspect, but considering women as their equals. And I'm sure that it, might have, it, it took me a long time to be recognized as a, as a woman in my career, and but I got there. But you have to fight very hard to uh, get to the top as a woman compared to men. It's much easier for men. And uh, it's education and education and education. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as for women or men. Because... I, would, I would agree with you entirely. Yeah. Remember, keep the questions short because they won't be able to hear you because you don't have a microphone. Um, the very famous doctor from North London would like to ask a question. Brief question, please. Very brief. Um, what are the chances that you're going to achieve this in a given time? Um, I think the chances of achieving this by 2030, um, well, I, I'm going to have to rely on my eternal optimism that we can achieve it, but it's going to require you and me and everybody here to do something about it tonight, tomorrow, next week. Little things will actually build up. You know, we need to keep putting drips in the pond and it will, it will eventually, um, we will eventually get there. Some interesting questions coming online now. Um, one is, uh, uh, you can read it. Um, uh, are there any men in the room apart from the chair? <laughs> as me. <laughs> and are they going to ask any questions? Well, we've just had one. Thank you from a man. We've got another man over there. Um, wondering if this is an all women echo chamber. I mean, <laughs> yeah, th that's interesting, isn't it? And then another question, a, a comment from Amelia Lake. Thank you, Amelia. Your excellent presentation has covered issues facing women in the first 50 years of life in great detail. Can you comment on improving social and economic situation for older women? Well, yes, I mean, I, I've got a good reason to be very keen on looking after women in their post-reproductive age. <laughs> yes, but I mean, you can't have escaped the question as notice that um, there has been a real zeitgeist over the last six months or so about um, menopause and recognizing, recognizing and understanding and making allowances for women menopause, uh, who are menopausal and providing them with help and advice. And also, um, trying to get them to understand what they can do to prevent ill health in later life and using that, if you like, as a, as a, as a, as a, a health check at the age of 45 to 55, let's say average of 51 years. Um, and I think one of the reasons why there seems to have been so much traction uh, with this um, menopause in the workplace, and wow, as you know, the well-being of women have got this in the work pl workplace pledge campaign, is that by saying to employers, look, this is crazy, it makes no economic sense, you're going to be losing women at the most productive uh, and the most experienced part of their lives and their careers. Why aren't you just making some more adaptations for them um, so that they can carry on working? So pre-pandemic, we were hearing on that Better for Women report that one in four women um, who were menopause in the workplace were leaving because they felt that they couldn't continue, they couldn't discuss it with anybody. Um, I think that the COVID, again, the COVID lockdown has meant that flexible working is now something that many employers consider may be a possibility. It's not possible for every job, but for many more it is now in which we to be shown it can, can, uh, can potentially work. So I think there's a lot to be done for um, menopause uh, women or women in their post-reproductive years. Um, and I think that the we, we will be seeing more of it. There is a, you can sign up to the Wellbeing of Women uh, website and you know sign up to that pledge. Um, and we want individuals to do that as well as companies. So there's a toolkit on it, giving you lots and lots of really useful, practical ideas about what you can do for the women in your life or the women in your workforce, depending where you're coming from, um, to help them continue to you know, utilize their skills and their experience and not leave the workforce because they can't cope. Sure, and actually tonight, um, Henrietta, one of uh, Bowden Joe's, one of our trustees, is interviewing Mariella Forstrup, uh, talking exactly about that. That'll be online on RSM Live. We've got time for maybe two more questions. So, this is a bit random uh, over there. Hello. Hello, Speak up nice and loud. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely fabulous talk, Leslie. How do we educate the Taliban? 
Ooh, that's a good one. How do we well, educate the Taliban? Yeah, so Fiona, I think I'd have to pass that one back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's, if I wanted to really kill you with power. Mm. Well, I mean, if I'd really wanted to kill you with PowerPoint tonight, I could have shown you all these, these figures about what has happened in Afghanistan. So since, um, since the occupation there, or since the, the, the UN forces went in, maternal mortality has not just halved, it had gone down to 20% of what it used to be. It's still incredibly high. It's still a red mark on my map, but it's going to go back again, it is thought. And I don't know what we can do. I don't understand how people can want to rule out 51% of the population and not feel that they've got a contribution to make and not cherish you know, what, they, what they are able to provide. It is a complete, completely mystified, completely mystified. Just before I hand over to Sandra Nat, um, I, just to prove we're not a female echo chamber, we'll have the gentleman at the very back, back there. I just did want to raise the point about faith-based organisations. Of course, it did, as the lady said, not just the Taliban. I mean, Americans have strong faith-based organisations that prohibit abortion. Is this a target worth aiming at? And is it one of your elephants in the room, you think? Faith. Well, the, the opinions that are drilled into people in many, many different faiths, mm -hmm. religions, yeah, and then the problem with the US one. Just, just repeat the question. Uh, so, so should we be should we be targeting um, should we be targeting faith based groups which prohibit abortion and often uh, prohibit women having more having autonomy? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a very difficult question. I mean, they are so well funded. I know when I was um, when I was debating at the RCOG to support decriminalizing abortion, the um, the, what was it called? The Catholics? No, it wasn't the Catholics for Choice who were very supportive. But there was a Citizen Go, uh, which is a website funded um, with enormous sums of money in America. All you had to do was go onto the thing, press on Citizen Go, and put your email address in, and they would immediately craft the letter individually addressed to me um, and signed off with their name. And I've got thousands and thousands of them. So it's, they're a very big organization. But, I, th I think one can only carry on talking about what happens when you prohibit it. I mean, what's happening in Texas at the moment is really, really shocking. If you're a pregnant woman in Detroit, I mean, it, the US maternal mortality statistics are, are starting to be some of the worst in the world. They are absolutely extraordinary. And it's not just because of the way that they fund their health services and how very poor people living in downtown Detroit can't access Medicare. It is also about the upstream things, the family planning, the lack of family planning, and the complete prohibition of abortion services. It's really, really tragic. Well, thank you so much. We, we better stop there. I, I'm sure there are a load more questions that we could ask, but we are going to adjourn momentarily. Stay there, uh, as it just from a, are we going to uh, adjourn momentarily to the uh, atrium outside? We'll be able to ask Leslie some questions directly. But now, uh, this is a joint meeting, RSM and the Linnaean Society, and here we have Sandra Knapp from the Linnaean Society. There you go. Listen, can I just say, on behalf of the society, that was absolutely amazing. And, and many of you in the audience probably don't know, but Leslie reminded me of how many years we've been doing this together. I thought it was 10, but it's 12. And this started out as a joint lecture between the RSM and the Linnaean Society because we had a joint interest in evolution and adaptation, which is one of the things that you mentioned during your talk about adaptation and how adaptation is one of the important things that we can do to help with some of these problems. So this is, this is a fantastic 12th, 13th, perhaps it's unlucky, 13th lecture for, for this, joint, this joint effort between the two societies. And I'm often asked because the Linnaeus Society was founded in 1788 and we're the oldest extant society which is devoted to the study of the, his, of the science of natural history in all of its branches. And I would say actually that medicine is part of the science of natural history because it's about the world around us. It's about how the world works and how we as human beings interact with that world. So I would say that actually, I think the Royal Society of Medicine should come and join us. But I'd just like to thank you very much. And as, as Parveena asked a question about, the, about climate change and Leslie and I were talking about this ahead of time. And, I, and I've just come from two weeks in Glasgow at the Conference of the Parties 
for the Convention on Climate, the IPCC, the uh, Convention on Climate Change. And one of the very interesting things that happened there was that previous COPs for climate have always talked just about climate and just about technology and how technology would solve our problems associated with climate. So climate was seen as a problem, biodiversity was seen as a problem, gender equality was seen as a problem. And as Leslie showed very clearly in her talk, all of those things are interconnected. And at this COP, which is the very first time I think it's really happened in the UN meetings that I've ever been to, is that all of those topics were discussed as being aspects and facets of a single problem, which is about how we create a habitable planet, not only for ourselves, the human species, but for all species. And I think that's something that is a huge step forward. And however depressed we might be about the fact that we're not going to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels because various countries came in at the last minute and took the word reduce out. Actually, the fact that we've thought about all of those facets, gender equality, biodiversity in nature, and climate as facets of the same problem, I think gives us hope for the future. And I think, Leslie, you're absolutely right that we all must be advocates because maybe this is an echo chamber. Maybe we all do think these are important things. But as is obvious from Leslie's talk, there are many outside who perhaps don't think of this as important as, important as we do. So it's our job now to go forward from tonight and from the climate COP, go forward and actually become those advocates which talk to people who don't think the same way as we do. And that can be really difficult and really hard, but it's a job that we all must do, both from the Royal Society of Medicine, the Linnaean Society and all of us here tonight. So Lessa, you've just really kind of made me feel more hopeful than I was which is fantastic. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of both of our societies with this little tiny certificate. <laughs> which I'm actually both managed to sell.